try to leave it, leave it, leave it. Hey. Hey, hey, hey. Come here, Peter. Hey. I bind you in Jesus' name. Get over here. To your knees. Oh, no. Stand back up. I'm sorry. Stand back up. I'm gonna hit you. Then come on. Ah! I promise I'll get you come on. and your family come on. and all these people. I will kill them come on. and kill you. I will hurt you. I can't. I can't. Ah! What you just saw is some of the worst acting you will ever see. And it's time that the truth be told about so-called deliverance ministries and casting out demons and the new movie by Greg Locke come out in Jesus' name. Well, welcome to Real Talk with Jordan Riley, where the real talk does not come from me. It comes directly from God's word. And today we're going to be showing clear proof that we cannot cast out demons that Christians cannot have demons, and Greg Locke's new movie, Come Out in Jesus' Name, is absolutely unbiblical and is a lie that is leading people astray. Are you, are you ready to get going? Let's do it. Number one, can we cast out demons? And I'm saying right now and emphatically, no, we cannot. And sadly, most people try to use Mark 16, verses 17 and 18 to say that we can. <laughs> Because these signs shall follow them that believe in my name. They shall cast out devils. Now let's read those two verses and actually see what it says. Okay, it's Mark 16, verses 17, 18. It says, quote, And these signs shall follow them who believed. In my name they shall cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues, and they will pick up serpents. And if they drink deadly poison, it will not hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. And almost every false teacher I know and many people who don't even really know God's word love to use these verses. See, we can do it. See, Jesus said that we could cast out demons. No. And you're going to see why when we get into the technical aspect of this. But also, did you notice that most people love to quote the first verse or the first sentence in the first verse, but they stop there. They'll love to say these signs will follow in my name. They cast out demons and speak with new tongues, but they go no further. Why is that? It's because it's not verifiable. See, you can't tell really if someone has a demon. You know, you can sit there and someone might be convulsing and stuff and you, you yell at them and all of a sudden they stop convulsing. Oh, see, I, I, I got a demon out of them. Did you really? We can't verify that. But the other part of it says, well, if they pick up serpents, they drink deadly poison, it won't hurt them. They lay hands on the sick, they'll recover. That is medically verifiable. And you will never see these people Greg Locke and false teachers of, of his kind and people in this movie, you'll never see them go to a VA hospital where veterans have missing limbs from being in war. You'll never see them lay hands on them and see them grow back their limbs. You'll never see them go to a cancer ward and clear the whole thing out. Why? Because that would verify that they are false teachers and prove them liars because they can't do it. Also, if you study these verses, again, Mark 16 verses 17 and 18, you will see that they are not from Jesus. They were written by a scribe later. If you go back and actually study the Codex Vaticanus and the Codex Sinaiticus, you will see that Mark 16 ended at verse eight. See, verses nine through 20 are nowhere found in the earliest, most ancient and reliable manuscripts, which is why most, the best Bibles that we have, if you look at them, you'll see that verses nine through 20 are in parentheses, because again, they are not authorized text. Also, Eusebius and Justin Martyr were among many of the first and second century church fathers who proved that there was nothing after Mark 16, verse 8. They wrote about it. So let's look at Mark 16, verses 9 through 20. It's very interesting. It sounds nothing like Mark. And over 18 words and phrases were used in verses 9 through 20 that Mark never once used in his whole entire book. That should get our attention. Also, where it does end in verse eight and starts again in verse nine, it's very abrupt and weird. There is no flow. Mark ended his thought in verse eight and someone restarted it in verse nine. That's why there's no flow to continue. Now, did Jesus give his 12 disciples and some close associates the ability to heal and cast out demons? Absolutely. Matthew 10, 
Luke 10 is very clear. But that was for a specific purpose and also for a specific time. It was done to authenticate the message and the messenger and to show that they were from God. Now, you have to know this, that they didn't have the word of God like we do today. You know, 1 John 4, 1 says we're to test all things against God's word, but they didn't have that. So Jesus gave them power to authenticate the message of the gospel. Also, if you look at the epistles to the church, which is Romans through Jude, you will see that casting out demons is never, and I repeat, never once taught or commanded for us to do. Just something to kind of think about. However, we are told to resist the devil, James 4, 7, and also to put on the full armor of God so that we can stand firm, Ephesians 6, verses 10 through 18. It's about standing, not rebuking, not binding. And Matthew 16 and Matthew 18, where it mentions the word bind, is not talking about what you think it is. It's about church discipline. It's about going along with the word of God, not about rebuking and casting out demons and binding them. So, please understand this. No, we cannot cast out demons. Please know that Jesus has all the authority. We have none. Matthew 28, 18. So what do we do when we're confronted maybe with someone who might have a demon? Okay. Are we going to just start yelling them? I bind you in the name of Jesus. No, we don't do that. Are we to just say, you know, in the name of Jesus, be gone. No, we don't do that as well. Now, what are we supposed to do? We need to share the gospel with that person. Okay, we need to preach the word. Romans 1.16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation. And also, what did Jesus do when he was tempted by Satan in the wilderness? Matthew 4, verses 1 through 11. He quoted scripture. He says, it is written. Three different times he did that. He could have bound and rebuked Satan, but he didn't. He used the word of God, which according to Hebrews 4.12 is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. Again, we confront people with the gospel. They need to hear it. That's the power, not our big decrees. And a side note to all this, I want you to hear this. Why would we cast them out? Why would we cast out demons? Because if you look at Luke 11, 24 through 26 and Matthew 12 verses 43 and 45, you will see that demons, when they were casted out, they got extremely mad and began to torture and re put revenge on other people. Why would we want to have that happen? That doesn't sound like something we should be doing. Okay, so please understand that demons are cast out when the gospel is preached and God does a work in someone's heart and in their life, not when we say certain incantations or command them to go. So it's time we stop listening to Greg Locke and Isaiah Saldivar and Vlad Savchuk and Daniel Adams and Alexander Pagini and Mike Signorelli. These guys are false teachers. They are wolves in sheep's clothing. And leads to number two, because they believe that Christians can have demons. And I'm telling you right now, that is 100% absolutely not true. Okay. Yes, we can be tempted by a demon. Yeah. We can be oppressed from the outside by a demon, but no, a Christian cannot be possessed by a demon. Let's look at what 2 Corinthians 6 verses 15 and 16 says. It says, quote, or what harmony does Christ have with Belial? Or what does a believer share with an unbeliever? Or what agreement does the temple of God have with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. That's awesome. Also look at 1 Corinthians 6, verses 19 through 20. It says, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit and we were bought with a price. We're not under the control of Satan anymore. We are God's possession. And just to give a couple, there are so many verses that talk about how we are victorious. We're not possessed. We're victorious because of the Holy Spirit, because of what God has done. Colossians 1.13, Romans 8.37, 1 Corinthians 15.57, 2 Corinthians 2.14, and 1 John 2.13, just to name a few. But my favorite verse that I want you to catch for this is 1 John 4.4. 4. It says, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Did you notice where Satan is? Did you notice where the demonic hosts are? They're in the world. <laughs> greater is he that is in us, he being the Holy Spirit. Okay, we're possessed, controlled by the Holy Spirit when we've been saved by Jesus. 
Okay, so we can't be possessed by both. We can't be possessed by a demon or by Satan if we have been saved by Jesus. And understand this, and I love how Costi Hen puts it. When we've been saved, we're full of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit does not allow roommates. Number three, and this is about, we're gonna look at Greg Locke's movie, Come Out in Jesus' Name. And I need to be very honest with you, I wouldn't waste 10 cents on this movie. It is pure, unbiblical nonsense. And it's making Greg a lot of money, getting him a lot of, of attention, giving him a bigger platform, and building his empire. Now let me tell you something about false teachers. You think so many times that people fall prey to false teachers. And that, in a sense, can be true at times. But I think the dominant theme in scripture is just the opposite. False teachers are God's judgment on people who don't want God, but in the name of religion, plan on getting everything their carnal heart desires. That's why a Joel Olstein is raised up. Those people who sit under him are not victims of him. He is the judgment of God upon them because they want exactly what he wants and it's not God. So you see that these false teachers that, you know, Paul Washer brings up, it's a judgment on people because they want what their evil hearts desire. They don't want God. They want entertainment. They want feel good stuff. They want to have power and authority and all these different things. They don't want to submit to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now let's quickly remind ourselves of who Greg Locke really is because it's not very good. I spelled cessationism all capital. I was Come against on. all tongues, all signs, all wonders, all deliverance. All of that had ceased. You know, I had my King James Bible and that was it. God didn't speak anymore. Well, the problem is God started speaking and things started happening Come in on. our church. Come on. You better look in my eyeballs. We ain't afraid of you, you stinking witch. You devil worshiping Satanist witch. We cast you out in the name of Jesus Christ. We break your spells. We break your curse. We got your first name. We got your last name. We even got an address for one of you. I know his address. Didn't even know him. Know his age. Know his birthday. Know his next assignment. I know it all. Because a stupid devil told me. And I can't unhear what I've heard. I can't unsee what I've saw. If they go through round two and you start showing up all these masks and all this nonsense, I'll ask you to leave. I will ask you to leave. I am not playing these Democrat games up in this church. Remember, Greg left his wife for a younger woman who is a church secretary. Also, he partners with false teachers, which I've named earlier. Greg twists God's word constantly, and he is not Christ-like, and he has anger issues all the time. He's done that with me personally. He's done that with many friends who have tried to lovingly confront him or talk to him about the truth. He lashes out in anger all the time, which... How does that describe anybody that's in Christ? How does that even go along with a pastor, the qualifications of a pastor in 1 Timothy 3 verses 1 through 11? It doesn't. So if Greg is not a godly man and he's not qualified to be a pastor, then why would you want to see a movie that he puts out? So I want to be clear about this movie. And I, I want to share a couple points. Number one, this movie clearly goes against God's word. It affirms, it's, it literally says that we can cast out demons. We've already talked about how we can't. It also says that Christians need deliverance. Deliverance is for the church. No, Christians don't de need deliverance at all, okay? Deliverance isn't for the church. Salvation is for the church. Also, this movie partners and affirms many false teachers. We've read the list, which violates Ephesians 5.11. We are to have nothing to do with the deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. Also, uh, this movie twists God's word. Again, Mark 16, verses 17, 18. It's twisted and mangled to fit Greg Locke's narrative. And finally, it promotes many charismatic false doctrines. This is literally the new apostolic reformation, the NAR. It's about prophecy and healing, words of knowledge, <coughs> apostles and prophets. This is not biblical and does not line up with God's word. See, deception is running wild today and people are being deceived by this movie. Just like Jesus Revolution, just like The Chosen, and just like the so-called revival at Asbury. People want feel-good entertainment. They want a message of empowerment. I am, I am one with God, I can do what God tells me I can do and I am, I'm amazing. No, I'm sorry. 
They don't want his word. They don't want to humble themselves. They don't want to submit to Christ, walk in obedience, crucify their flesh, leave everything for Jesus. That's what it is to follow Christ. The gospel is not about your happiness. It's not about your empowerment. It's not about your mighty deeds. It's about what Jesus did to save sinners of whom I am the worst. And we cannot save ourselves. Please understand that. And I want you to hear me say this today. There are, there are demons in this movie that need to be exposed, that need to be cast out. And truly, I'm going to tell you right now, it's Greg Locke and his friends. 